Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this week's Research Bite that we're running in place of our annual Inky conference that this year would have happened in June in Toronto, but unfortunately, due to COVID, we are uh, not able to do face-to-face meetings. However, it has not meant that we have had a lack of interesting and innovative presenters. And so I am really, really honored to have one of my closest friends from grad school presenting today on his PhD work. Dr. Adam Herring is a 2012 grad from the U of C and currently a wildlife veterinarian with the Urban Wildlife Stewardship Society out on Vancouver Island. And his PhD work focused on the effect of Theropodes ovis on killing off bighorn sheep in the Rockies, and then its possible transmission to domestic sheep. So he's going to be talking a little bit about the various tools and lessons that were learned that could actually be valuable resources for wildlife managers to use when engaging stakeholders in developing adaptive management plans. So Adam, Um, it's going to be over to you. If we can have everybody please mute your lines on your end so that we can make sure that there are no strange beeps in the middle of the presentation. Thanks. Okay. Thanks so much for that introduction, Jasmine. Um, So like Jasmine said, my name is Adam Herring. I'm a veterinarian uh, in BC. I split my time between uh, small animal clinical practice and some fun wildlife work. And my PhD work I got to do on this really awesome group of bighorn sheep. Um, I feel a little bit funny presenting here because this is not a zoonotic disease. It's not something that can be transmitted to humans. And, um, and just so that I'm not giving any false impressions, I think it's a very, very minimal risk to domestic sheep in BC. Not that it's zero risk, it definitely, the risk risk exists, but uh, I think it's quite low risk for transmission over to our domestic sheep in BC. So a little bit of um, an outline. I'm gonna be talking about a few of the portions of my PhD research. Uh, obviously there's more than we can get through in a 20 minute presentation. And so I'm gonna probably jump through some of my methods and results a little bit quickly and try and hit the highlights of it because I think that's what's most interesting and important to everybody. And then I'm happy to answer questions at the end. So I tried to take a larger overarching view of the disease in this population. We looked a little bit at where this disease outbreak came from, tried to develop some tools to better detect it more rapidly, um, and then did a treatment trial on our animals. And then finally, I tried to do a chapter that looked a little bit more at the management implementation portion of wildlife management. And that took me into the realm of adaptive management and a bit of the social sciences side of management. And and I found that really interesting. So to begin with, in terms of background, Seropdes is a non-burrowing ectoparasitic mite of the family Seropdidae. It's best recognized by these characteristic long jointed pretarsi or suckers on the end of their it's differentiated, uh, the different species of Seropdes are differentiated by the host in which they infest, the location of infestation on that host, and then the length of this little structure called the outer epistosomal sete, which is this one particular hair on a male mite, and some poor scientists way back when did a whole bunch of measurements of all of the little hairs on the mites to try and figure out what could be used to differentiate them. But as with many things, it's been debated heavily what the what the reality is in terms of the different species of Seropdes and um, and whether we should even really call them separate species of Seropdes at all versus separate ecotypes because some cross infection trials have been done that demonstrated that different species or or previously classified species of Seropdes could actually interbreed and and cross infect different hosts. So it's been suggested that they should be unified under the name of priority, Seropdes ovis, um, which most papers reference to an author by the name of Herring in 1838. So I thought that was pretty sweet to to study a parasite that was mostly referenced to my own name um, more than 100 years before I was born. But it turns out that it was actually first 
first described by Viborg a little earlier than that. So that little feather in my cap got taken away. So Seropthes is most well known for an uh, awful disease called sheep scab in domestic sheep. This is a particularly nasty case of it. We, that seen uh, and, and struggled with in many parts in the world, but especially in the UK. The parasite was first recognized in the early 1900s in the U.S. and has been seen in bighorn sheep throughout the U.S. in the 19th and 20th centuries. But it's since been eradicated from domestic sheep in both Canada and the U.S. In Canada, it was eradicated in the 1920s and in the U.S. in the 1970s using multiple treatments of macrocytic lactones. Uh, but it presents a much bigger challenge in wild sheep because we don't have the option of catching all of the animals and treating them multiple times every couple of weeks the way that we can with domestic sheep that are captive. Um, and so it's plagued wildlife managers throughout the states for a long time. It was first officially identified in Canada in 2011. Um, and since its, since its first report of symptomatic animals, which started coming in around 2003 or 2004 in the Okanagan, the population of affected sheep or the population where the parasite is known to exist in, in uh, bighorn sheep has declined dramatically. This is a picture of the index case or, or when it was first identified anyhow. This was a ram that was shot in southern BC for this generalized mange. But I should mention that most bighorn sheep only exhibit a mange in their ears and it's very rare that it causes this kind of general mange like this one had. So for those of you not familiar with uh, the Okanagan area of British Columbia, it's the little pin on the map here. Um, so it's just barely north of the American border. Um, and there's a few ideas about where it might have come from, one of them being that maybe it just moved from one population to another through natural movement of bighorn sheep. The problem is that it's actually quite a ways between the infested population in BC and the next closest bighorn sheep population, and there's some big waterways that would seemingly prevent movement of sheep naturally. So other thoughts are maybe that there were some contaminated wildlife capture equipment that weren't effectively cleansed between working on different populations, or maybe that it came from another competent host like rabbits. So we did some morphologic and molecular comparison of the mites found in our BC bighorn sheep with those found on bighorn sheep in the U.S. and with rabbits. And we compared a couple of genes as well as those long outer epistis almosete, the hairs on the male mites. This is a picture of the male mite, the, the epistosomal lobe and sete of the male mites. And you can see the Canadian bighorn sheep in the center looks more similar to the rabbit ones than it does to the U.S. ones. And if you look at the length of the epistosomal lobe, you can also, or the epistosomal sete, the hair, you can also see that the Canadian ones in blue group much more closely with the, with the rabbits that were collected from Canada, the Seropthes collected off of rabbits in red, than they do from the USA bighorn mites. And the same results were corroborated by the molecular comparison in these first couple boxes. You can see the Canadian bighorn sheep mites were more similar genetically to the rabbit mites than they were to the USA bighorn sheep mites. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't get the second gene to sequence, so we had to do it in the rabbit mite. So we had to do a comparison with a uh, uh, previously referenced Seropthes caniculi, which is what they used to call Seropthes that infested rabbits. And again, on that second gene, the Canadian bighorn sheep mites grouped more closely with the Seropthes caniculi than they did with the USA bighorn sheep mites. So the take home point is that the Canadian bighorn mites most likely came from rabbits. And this is the first ecotype. Uh, the first report of this ecotype infesting bighorn sheep, all of the American bighorn sheep mites have fit more closely with the, with the Seropthes ovus or the traditionally um, sheep infesting, domestic sheep infesting mites. So the question of where it came from, there used to be a game farm in the area that's now infested. And after interviewing some previous staff of that game farm, which was closed in 1999, it turned out there were some feeder rabbits that were used for feeding the carnivores that lived on the game farm. And there were also bighorn sheep known to escape. So I suspect that that was where that species jump happened. Maybe it was food that moved, maybe it was hay that was in contaminated that moved from the rabbits to the sheep or something like that. But I think that's probably when our species jump happened. 
and that's likely the source of disease in Canada. Um, and, and I think an important note about that is that I don't think that's necessarily evidence that wild transmissions are likely to happen. Otherwise, I think we probably would have happened, seen them happen in other situations. I think this was an artificial situation that created that opportunity. And so it's certainly worth managers keeping in mind that that can happen, but not necessarily worth majorly changing the way we look at Seropti's management. Our next test was looking at uh, improved detection. So we were trying to validate an ELISA that was developed for domestic sheep to make sure that that works on Bitcoin sheep as well. And one of the reasons that that's useful is for trying to detect subclinical infestations in animals that might be used for translocations, like was done in exactly the currently infested area. So sheep were taken out of the currently infested area in 2009, so after the first clinical animals were reported, but before it was officially identified, and they were moved across the river. This dark dotted line on the map here represents the barrier of the highway and a major fence. And as far as we know, the Seropti's infestations currently only exist on the west side of that line. And a translocation was done across that line before we knew we had the parasite. And had we had the ELISA then, we might have been able to better detect whether those animals were infested or not. As far as we know, there haven't been any animals that have moved that, that have the infestation on the east side of that line. And, and those animals are still closely monitored. So we think we got lucky in that case, but it's uh, further evidence for the need for a test like this. So we did an indirect ELISA, compared known positive animals with known negative animals. You can see they actually group out pretty nicely. The Canadian positives and U.S. positives all have a significantly higher optical density than our negatives. And we also ran the test on one unknown herd, a whole bunch of samples from one unknown herd in the U.S., and determined that that herd was likely disease-free, even though they had some suspect symptoms. So our ELISA has pretty good sensitivity and specificity. Um, but it's difficult to say because all of our Canadian infested animals were very symptomatic. Uh, we didn't really get to test this ELISA on asymptomatic positive animals, uh, so that could be a weakness of this test. Then we did a treatment trial to try and compare, uh, to try and look at seeing if we can find a treatment that would work effectively with a single application, because like I said, the disease was eradicated from domestic sheep using drugs that require many applications and don't have a residual effect in terms of preventing reinfection or clearing the host after a single treatment. Um, and so this is my conducting a treatment trial in five easy steps. First, I needed to recruit an army of volunteers, and lucky for me, people came out of the woodwork. Then I needed to design and build some research pens. And then I needed to go and catch a whole bunch of infested bighorn sheep. And then when uh, that didn't work, we had to hire a helicopter and brought in a whole bunch of sheep. And then we treated them. Uh, at first, we treated them with a drug called Long Range. And then we followed them every month to see how it worked. And the first drug that we tried totally didn't work. And I had a great little joke tied in here in my dissertation defense, but I don't really have time for that today. So we're just going to skip to the one that did work. Um, the drug Berbecto uh, Fluralanar is a anti-tick medication that's used in dogs and cats in Canada, in some other species in other parts of the world. There's a label form for chickens, uh, I believe in the UK. And we tried a couple different dose ranges because um, because we didn't, we, as far as we could tell, it was going to be a very safe drug for use, but uh, we didn't really know what dose range could be used. And um, so we tried a high and a low oral dose and a higher and a lower topical dose. The high oral dose, we tried pretty high because we thought the rumen would probably break it down. Um, and, and we had our animals separated so that all of our treated animals were in one pen and all of our control animals were in the other. We collected a whole bunch of information every month, things like their ear lesion severity, their, the presence of live mites versus dead mites, and then general health samples, body condition, blood for our ELISA, that sort of thing. Most of what I'll talk about here are the ear lesion severity scores and the presence of live mites. Here's a picture of our ear lesion severity scores. So as they got worse, um, our severity score had to do with how much of the ear pinna was affected. And you can see the LO and HO groups are our orally treated groups, and the LT and HT groups are our topically treated groups. And we saw great efficacy out of our orally treated groups, but not out of our topically treated groups. 
And the residual ear lesion severity, I think, is mostly to do with how much damage was done to the ear, so that even though all of the mites seemed to be killed, the ear couldn't recover back to a normal state, and so it created some subjectivity in their assessment of their ear lesion severity. But this is a picture of one particular animal, and this is actually really an average animal that got treated um, with the with the fluorolanar oral. You can see how much it improved over the course of four months. And then as we were preparing for release, we treated all of the animals with our high-dose oral fluorolanar to try and clear them all of the mite before we let them back out into the landscape. And after one month, um, we didn't find any live mites on any of our animals, and we saw dramatically improved ear lesion scores in all of our animals after a month. So that was very encouraging. And so that tells us that fluorolanar is a good treatment option, but there's a lot of questions that remain, things like, can we deliver remotely? maybe an abated feed or something like that. Is it safe to give as a free choice? What's the toxic dose range? Uh, how long are they protected from reinfection? So for example, if we were gonna go and catch them and, and force feed them this treatment, how long do we have to get the entire herd before some of them become susceptible to reinfection again? Can we treat every animal in the herd? Is that even possible? Is it safe for use in a hunted population? Are there other ecosystem effects? Yada, yada, yada. So there's still so many questions, and that leads us to our last topic here, which is how do we implement action in the face of so much uncertainty? There will always be more questions, and how do we avoid this analysis paralysis where we just keep on saying we need more research before we can do anything? And one option is adaptive management. So adaptive management, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is the process of learning by doing. There's a number of different styles or approaches to adaptive management, but essentially you create, a, you assess the problem, you create a potential intervention, you implement it, you monitor the results, you evaluate whether you're having the effect you're going for, and then you adjust your strategy as needed. And there's a few different styles, some based more on modeling, some based more on the social science, the stakeholder involvement side of things. Um, I found a really awesome paper that I tried to use throughout my last chapter, looking at the nine criteria for successful adaptive management that were proposed by an author named McFadden et al. And I found that to be an interesting framework that I could sort of divide up and see what was being done in different regions um, and, and look at whether they're satisfying those criteria that were proposed. Because Seropteus isn't really being managed in most American bighorn sheep populations, I didn't really feel like it made much sense to do a, a review of how it was being managed. So instead, I did it on respiratory disease. Uh, respiratory disease in bighorn sheep, for those of you unfamiliar with it, is a really nasty polymicrobial disease that um, generally is made very complicated from a management perspective by the fact that the pathogens that cause this respiratory disease are generally um, asymptomatic or more relatively benign in domestic sheep populations, but really nasty in bighorn sheep populations and cause these long periods of um, poor recruitment. And so you have lambs dying year after year from pneumonia, while several mature adult males are, or mature adult animals are likely forming um, chronic shedders in the population and continuing to reinfect the lamb population every year. So you have these populations that are just over the course of many, many years having a really difficult time recovering. And many, many um, managers in the U.S. are actively trying to manage this disease. And so I felt like it was a better disease for me to focus my attention on, both because it's being so heavily managed and, and because it forms such a tricky and challenging problem because some of the main important stakeholders are the domestic sheep producers, but there's kind of nothing in it for them to take important action per, to prevent their domestic sheep from coming into contact with wild sheep. And so there's a lot of very heated opinions about how this should be managed. So I took a simple approach of asking the different managers, the biologists and ecologists and veterinarians, what are your goals? What are your actions? And what are some of the main barriers you're interacting? And what are some of the successes you've seen? And I divided, I did a thematic analysis and divided their interventions um, and, and the discussion points into some of the important considerations for the four main categories of uh, wildlife management, prevention, control, eradication, or doing nothing when we can't do anything at all. In terms of prevention, the main things were preventing contact with domestic animals, uh, preventing 
human movement of animals that that might transmit the um, respiratory disease from one population to another, and investigating ways that we can reduce wild sheep movement between potentially clean and um, diseased populations. With control, there were a number of different strategies that were being discussed, things like habitat modification, controlled burns, that sort of thing. Eradication, there are some test and call operations that are happening, and one of the big challenges has been figuring out exactly what we need to be testing for and finding sensitive tests for it. So over the years, there's been different pathogens that have been considered to be the most important, and right now, it appears that MOVI is, uh, is the leading hypothesis in terms of the most um, important pathogen for us to try and remove from herds. And when that's removed from herds, even the pastorella seem to cause much more minor losses from pneumonia. And then especially important, I found to be those, those situations and, and aspects that prevented management from being able to happen at all. So those were things like social and political barriers, resource barriers, physical barriers where animals simply couldn't be caught in the in the terrain that they lived in, and then information and knowledge barriers where we just didn't know what we needed to do. Um, and and I looked at a number of different things, and and one of the things that I found really interesting in reflecting on this was how those first two criteria and the stake in the nine criteria for adaptive management were really really important: the stakeholder involvement and defined objectives. And I'll just tell you a really quick story about in my research. Um, we worked very closely with the Penticton Indian Band, and I, um, because of some past experiences, really wanted to make sure that uh, that we developed a really positive and trusting relationship with that Indian Band, and um, and so they were involved in the project together with uh, me representing the University of Saskatchewan and the provincial biologists from the very beginning, and we worked through all of the steps of it together. So it was really an amazing shared research and endeavor, and. One of the things that I think really spoke to the trust that we built was one of the times after maybe the second or third handling, I had one of the um, one of the First Nations employees come to me and express that they were really upset by the way the last handling had happened. And the reason was because they felt like we hadn't even really been talking to the sheep and explaining to them what was going on. They felt like we were just rushing through the handling and, and they thought that that would be more stressful for the animals. And it came to my attention that this was just a disconnect in our cultural um, background and, and that the desire to have low stress handling was in everybody's best interest and what everybody wanted. And the way that we thought we could do that wasn't necessarily the same. And so for me, I was just trying to get through the handling as quickly as possible because I thought from, from my background and my education, I believe that the sheep are very stressful anytime they're being handled, and the less time we can handle them, the better, because we weren't sedating them to do our handling. We just had them blindfolded and hobbled. And from her cultural background, explaining to the sheep what was going on was really, really important. And there was no reason why these two things couldn't be done at the same time. And so the next time we had a handling and, and before any further handlings, we had a little um, debrief with everybody and discussed how we wanted to be speaking quietly and making sure we were handling the animals with a lot of um, care and respect and gently, which we would hope we would do either way, but um, it never hurt, hurt to have a reminder. And we also had one of the elders come out and spend some time with us while we were handling the animals and taking samples, explaining to the animals what was being done. And that, wasn't, um, that, that was something that was easy to manage, but if we hadn't had the foundation of, of trust and relationship building, I never would have heard about that concern and that complaint. And it would have left a very sour taste in people's mouths and and uh, made it much more difficult for us to work together. And that really spoke to the importance of involving stakeholders from the very beginning in the process. And I think when it comes to bighorn sheep, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of people that really care a huge, great deal about those animals, whether, that are, whether those are First Nations people or stakeholders like the hunting community or like the um, non-consumptive wildlife conservationists. Uh, or biologists, all of those kind of things. And, and so this project was a really awesome opportunity for me to bring lots of those different groups together and really work on the same time. So we had tons of different volunteers that really helped make this project happen, and it couldn't have happened without all of them. Oh, I don't know why that's jumping through those lines again. Um, so there's a couple of my references, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Fantastic, Adam. Thank you so much.
And I know that uh, there was the whole, it's not a zoonotic disease, but one of the reasons that we wanted to include you has to do with both your adaptive management and also the fact that you were working with uh, potentially wildlife using um, meds or antiparasiticides, that kind of thing, that would normally be used in companion animals and, and or domestic livestock. And so the feasibility of doing it is um, something that in the future could potentially be used for zoonotic types of, of problems. So given what you've done, what is your impression on on that? Uh, great question. So I guess I think one of the big challenges with wildlife is um, just having an opportunity to handle them in the first place, and especially for a parasite like Sauroptes, where animals don't develop any sort of immunity to it, and so they can become reinfested with the parasite after being treated. You really have to take a larger population approach. Um, and many, I think, would argue that if you don't have the ability to treat every single animal in the population, you might as well not even try at all, um, <clears throat> which I think in principle I agree with, but I think that there's room for other potential approaches. So I think there, especially with something like an oral medication like this that is quite safe in the animals from what we can tell pharmacologically, um, I, I think that there's room for potential um, interventions like baited feeds with the, with the antiparasitic in important movement corridors between potentially infested and uninfested populations. So even if you can't eradicate it from one population, you can prevent it from moving or reduce the likelihood of it moving to another population. Um, I think there's also the possibility of having feeding stations within a population. And given the fact that it was likely introduced into the population in 1999 or before, because that's when the the, the game farm closed, and it wasn't until um, 2003 that any animals were symptomatic or a whole lot later that, that um, a lot of the population was symptomatic. I think it's possible to treat a large portion of the population um, each year for multiple years and potentially see the disease eradicated after a long-term approach that way. And it just depends on how big a priority a disease like this is um, in some American populations that have been infested with this parasite, they can see dramatic declines, and I think treatment is necessary. And in many populations, they seem to just level with, live with a low level of um, parasitism, and, and it doesn't have a huge population level impact. And so it's maybe less important in those populations. Okay, and so that was going to be the next question was, whether or not there was room to consider leaving bighorn sheep to develop a natural resistance without any kind of intervention if animal welfare issues are going to be a primary concern. I think that you have actually managed to answer that fairly fully, unless you had anything else that you wanted to add there. Um, yeah, I, sorry, what, can you repeat that question? <laughs> whether or not you felt that there was room to allow them to develop some natural resistance without intervention. Yeah, I I think it's difficult to say whether they would develop natural resistance just because of the fact that we're seeing this parasite in domestic sheep and they're not developing natural resistance. Um, and at the same time, that, that herd um, that I discussed in the ELISA chapter um, that that was the unknown herd that was that did have some symptoms they did historically definitely have microscope confirmed infestations and yet um all but one of our samples came back as eliza negative and one came back as a very weak positive so um that would suggest that they potentially did develop some resistance i definitely don't think that um large scale or or significant intervention is necessary in all situations I think it just depends on how it's impacting that particular population. Right. And so, it, as always, it's always a matter of context, right? And mm -hmm. we've had a number of, of our attendees comment just on the, in, the community engagement. And, and as you know, that's a, a topic that's dear to my heart. And it appears that 
um, it's gone forward quite healthily. With that uh, community, obviously, it took some time to build up that type of relationship. And have you found that there have been changes in the approach that is being taken in that area based on the work that you have done previously? Um, I think I, I think that I was standing on the shoulders of giants for this project. I think that um, that community engagement is not something, and, and that the development of that trust that that we use to be able to complete our project together is not something that was created thanks to my project. That was something that um, we chose to work with that community because there had been a history of working well together. Um, and and um, I relied very closely on some members of the community who um, had a finger on the pulse of the community and I knew could speak frankly with both me and with some of the members of the community so that I would get a heads up about important things that the community might not necessarily feel comfortable reaching out to me directly for. Um, but, but I think the important thing is that this kind of work needs to be done with a very long-term approach. And, and we need to realize that you can't go in there and say, I'm going to do this project and do it over two or three or five years and expect to have that kind of trust um, just because you mean the best. I think that it takes a long time um, and, and we need to take that long-term perspective. So, for example, in one situation, we were um, we had planned to go into our research pens on the Penticton Indian Band land to do a, a work day and and just work on building the pens. And I got a message that the morning of the, one of the work days from from one of the people who worked really closely within the community, saying that there had been a death in the community and our pens were really close to the cemetery, which I hadn't realized, and that we needed to call off the work day, which we were of course happy to do. But had we not had that person in the community who already had their finger on the pulse and already had um, the ear of the community, we wouldn't have known that and we would have had a whole bunch of us driving right by the cemetery the day after this really painful death. And, and so I think, um, I think that it's important to look around at, at what communities already have those relationships and build on those. And, uh, and the local biologists and ecologists, are, I think, are essential in that factor in terms of having that long-term relationship building opportunity with the communities they work with. Excellent. And then is the question of whether or not you saw a higher parasite load in sheep that were also showing respiratory symptoms, or if you saw any signs of resistance to furolaner in Dorotheus? Um, we didn't see any sign of resistance, for sure. I suspect that this is the first time Seropteus has ever been exposed to Fleurlaner. I haven't found any um, published reports anywhere of uh, a Soxazola um, drug or Fleurlaner specifically in a ruminant at all, um, and definitely not, not in a wild bighorn population. So we didn't see any sign of resistance. We didn't see any animals with any live mites after being treated orally. I think the topical treatments just probably weren't absorbed that well. Um, and then the question about the respiratory disease, the population that we were working on doesn't have respiratory disease, at least doesn't have MOVI, the main smoking gun of respiratory disease. We did have one ram that died of a pneumonia um, that had a pastorella pneumonia that died around the pens. And it had, uh, it was parasitized with seropteus, but not any worse than any of the other animals. So. I wouldn't say that I necessarily saw a correlation, but I don't have a, a what we would call a, a um, respiratory disease positive herd to compare it or, or to give those numbers in. Okay. Well, I am not getting any further questions coming through the chat. If anybody has any last questions for Adam, you can feel free to email them to me and I will get Adam to answer them and I'll send them out in the email that goes out as well as putting them up on the chat on our Facebook page. So, oh, and Adam says, please feel free to email me too. And he's included his email address there in the 
participants chat link. So if you wanted to uh, email him directly, you're more than able to do that. So thank you, Adam, for participating. We really appreciate it. Next week, we have uh, Lena and her grad student, Kaylee, um, are going to be coming back. Uh, unfortunately, we had had to cancel, uh, postpone their previous date that first week in August. And so they'll be discussing contact tracing for COVID and how you can actually leverage the wide health workforce during a pandemic response. Um, we have been asking if anybody is interested in presenting or if you have a grad student who is interested in presenting during Inky. We're in the midst of setting up our October presentations. So please contact us if you have a topic that you would like to share with us. And please, everyone, continue to stay safe and don't forget to wash your hands. Have a great week. Thanks, everyone.